The Volatis Aerospace Science Experiential Aerial Research Program, or SEER program, is designed to engage high school students in grades 9 to 12 in academic research activities using drones and machine learning technologies. Students will learn how to collect aerial research data using drones or uncrewed aerial systems that are equipped with specialized multispectral remote sensors capable of detecting light wavelengths outside the visible spectrum. They'll learn how data processing tools can turn two-dimensional images into incredible high-resolution 3D models, or digital twins, and then we'll use image classification tools to help develop machine learning algorithms to analyze the data that they collect. The objective of the research is to identify a novel process or solution to a relevant community sustainability issue, such as urban tree canopy diseases, agricultural crop diseases, or coastal and community litter problems. There are three projects in the SEER program that can engage your students wherever you are located, whether inner city urban or rural and remote communities. The Dutch Elm Disease Project seeks to identify American elm trees within the urban canopy that are infected with the devastating Dutch Elm Disease before the disease presents itself visually. Early detection of the disease will enable municipal crews to treat the trees with a fungicide, saving the tree from a would-be wood chipper. The Crop Disease Project is similar to the Dutch Elm Disease Project in that we are seeking to identify crop species, growth stages, and potentially different diseases across a variety of crops. This project is a great way to engage students from agricultural communities in the high-tech applications of the SEER program. The Litter Project seeks to identify the presence of litter and garbage debris that washes up on coastal beaches, along lake and river shorelines, or even community-based litter that can be found in urban parks and green spaces. In each program, students will use drones to collect data and use machine learning tools to analyze it. They will be engaged in the scientific discovery process throughout the course of the program. Hey everybody, welcome back to your Dawn of Autonomy podcast. I'm Dawn Zoldai, your host and the CEO of P3 Tech Consulting. We are in a month dedicated to the theme of education sponsored by USI. And speaking of sponsoring, this is our third year for the Volatis Above and Beyond series. And today's guest is Matt Johnson. He works with Volatis and he runs the SEER program that we're gonna talk about today. So thank you, Volatis. Thank you, USI. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So Matt, for those that don't know you, can you tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I used to be a high school teacher. I taught mathematics for five years. God bless you, <laughs> Matt. Oh, wow. I don't know how I did it. I don't anyway, know either. <laughs> I spent 10 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. I was a captain in the Army. and. Uh, I got into the drone industry in 2015 while I was still teaching, just as a side hustle to figure out what kind of opportunities there might be. And um, that really took off rather quickly. Within a year, I knew that there was there was just tons and tons of opportunity to pursue. Had to try and dial it down on a few specific industries that I thought were um, probably the best return on investment at the time. And so I focused on agriculture for a few years. Makes sense. Although I did a lot of other stuff, agriculture was my specialization and that started in 2016. Um, I continued teaching while I was doing this stuff on the side. I developed a training program to train new drone pilots. Um, I should mention I'm in Winnipeg in Canada and so initially my training program was a Canadian program that was designed to get people uh, trained up for the Transport Canada requirements at the time. Uh, and that went really well. And I would I would teach Monday to Friday, hop on a plane and fly across the country and, and run a two day 16 hour ground school, fly wow. home Sunday night and then teach Monday to Friday. And then sometimes I do that again, usually two weeks in a row would be enough and then I'd take a break, but it was going really, really well. I was getting on average in the first year about 15 people per course that I was running, which was incredible. That is. And uh, and so I decided in 2017 that I, I had to step away from teaching. And so I 
focused entirely on my business at that point. Um, in 2019, I was introduced to Glenn Lynch and uh, we talked about what kind of opportunities I was pursuing in this industry and what, what there was out there. Uh, what I wanted to do in terms of training a large network of pilots that would would benefit not only through the training, benefit, benefit us not only through the training, but also by having a network of services, service pilots that we could call on if we ended up getting large contracts. And uh, he liked that idea. And uh, we ended up partnering in 2019 and 2020. There was a few other companies that came on board and um, uh, I guess I don't know if everyone knows by now the history. I'm sure Glenn has kind of gone over that in the past, but uh, we're a publicly traded company now and on the TSX and the OTC markets in the United States. And uh, there's a there's a lot more than just a few companies in in Volatis Aerospace now. And I initially I was involved in a lot of different moving pieces. I've kind of hold myself off in a corner and focus on education specifically I've been able to circle back to my my roots I guess and uh, I'm passionate about training young people about well, just teaching in general I was quite passionate about teaching and um, even though math wasn't even my favorite subject that's what I was teaching and I loved teaching no matter what so uh, it was hard to step away and it was really nice to be able to develop these programs and come back into it to be able to work with kids and work with other adults and other teachers teaching them how to use drones effectively as as tools in the classroom not unlike computers are used as tools it's um, the approach that i've taken to using using drones as a as an educational tool is more focused on using it um, not to teach the drone itself but just to teach your curricular outcomes uh, teach trigonometry as a math teacher and so that was that was actually the first lesson I ever used was that that's amazing well first of all I, I want to interrupt you Matt uh, you know for those that don't know Glenn Lynch he is the CEO of Lattice Aerospace and Matt like you I actually met Glenn I'm going to say in 2019 as well uh, that's when I created my company and uh, he was one of the first people I kind of met through the industry and uh, you know we've been working together really ever since and so uh, I, I could see early on his passion, not only for the drone industry, but also uh, for education, for military service. I know his son is is also in the military. He's very proud of that and talks about that often. Thank you. That's for actually how I met him. I served with his son. Oh, my God. OK, so what, what an amazing story in small world. And and I love how you've been able to circle back to like what you love and what you're passionate about, uh, you know, education and uh you know this this uh passion you you that sparked in you for drones as a tool to teach all different kinds of things um so and and i imagine uh just like me your military background helps you in in ways you probably didn't even foresee uh in, in not only running your own business but now working with vladis and, and standing up the seer program so acronyms 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 we're both former military uh you know we use them all the time what does SEER stand for? So SEER is the Science Experiential Aerial Research Program. Um, I, I chose those words specifically because of uh, the fact that this isn't a, it's not really a drone program, it's a science program. First and foremost, I'm teaching science. I'm teaching about the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm talking about uh, photosynthesis and using just using a lot of different concepts from from science and physics and incorporating drones as the medium to to teach about those things and that's that's really what these programs are all about well i'll tell you what that makes it come to life for students and makes it so more interesting so true story in in high school i had a biology teacher and uh one of the projects he made us do he made us go out behind the school into the into the forest and we had to count all the groundhog holes and we had to do a report on the time of year it was, like how many groundhogs that we would estimate were out there given mating season and all these other things. You know, so 
like that kind of experiential learning is something like I can still remember that to this day, right? Like I'm old. <laughs> and so th those kind of palpable experiences for students that bring concepts to life um, are so incredibly valuable. And I love, uh, I love how you've incorporated drones into your pedagogy. So but here's my question to you. In doing this, you know, what problems were you trying to solve? In other words, you were teaching math, you had experience, you know, with high school students, you're looking around, you see this tool. What what made you come up with this idea like, hey, drones, I can use that for trigonometry in my math class. What problems were you trying to solve in creating SEER? Well, SEER, SEER has only come along. Uh, it began in 2001 with an idea in 2001 and has developed over the last few years. But initially, the first program that I created was a professional development uh, professional development program for teachers that I called Drones in the Classroom, and and that was created while I was still teaching um, because I wanted other teachers to to learn about this industry, and uh, everyone I knew at the time knew nothing about the drone industry and what was going yeah, on. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you're so yeah, yeah. yeah. It was very novel at that time, and uh, even still, though, I think a lot of people that aren't exposed to the drone industry think of them totally different than what they actually are. Um, yeah. They don't necessarily realize the the magnitude of what they're being used for in so many different fields and so many different ways. Yeah. Um, it, it's a disruptive. Well, you know, including art, you know, we always talk about STEM, but there's STEAM, and you know, you think of the cinematography that's happening with drones. And, I, you know, I think Joe Q. Public might even have a basic familiarity just from going to the movies and seeing the incredible panoramic shots from the sky. So they realize like, oh, in my in my brain, I'm always sitting there like, that's a drone shot, you know. But I, I think people I'm might- I'm actually familiar. saying that out loud and driving my family crazy. When <laughs> like, shot. So, you know, but like, but that art teacher, you know, or the photography club, you know, are they thinking in those terms right now? You know, even if they are aware of it. So, you know, I agree. I still think there's a big awareness issue when it comes to teaching and, and how to use drones for so many different disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that was the kind of the impetus. And I, I had seen how how awesome the technology was and I really wanted to kind of blow the kids away with this awesome piece of technology. Like when I was when I was early in my drone career, like I had a $4,000 drone fairly early on and then a $10,000 drone the next year in 2016. And um, like it was an Aspire One at the time, but it was it was pricey when I first invested in it. Yeah. And um, I had all the certifications that were all required to do everything. I was like, why don't I just bring this to school and uh, we'll do something cool with it. What can I do? Well, trigonometry is a neat thing to do. and I had the kids lying on the ground outside in the field measuring with clinometers this little tool that uh, measures angles and they're trying to get the angle up to the drone uh, and they knew the distance between where they were and where the drone was because I at the time we had to be 100 feet away and I said okay we're going to be 125 feet away just to be sure with two cones and and you tell me how high we are yeah and they were racing each other to try and calculate the the altitude of the drone and uh that was the first lesson i ever used a drone for and it um the engagement really blew me away because i've been teaching trigonometry already for four years at that I, point I, I was a student of it you know so i know like if if a teacher did that you know for us like that would have changed the game for me uh you know so that that is so cool that you did that so Okay, so you created this year program, you know, you, you tried it out with trigonometry, you realized there's something here that, that works, that inspires students, that helps them learn in a really unique way. Uh, so what are ultimately the objectives of this year program? Okay, so um, let me just finish uh, explaining uh, where, how I got to SEER. So first yeah, yeah, yeah. was the professional development program. Uh, COVID ended up hitting and just shutting down that. It, it was growing. I was getting lots of divisions. Uh, yeah. Teaching a lot of teachers. Yes. Um, when COVID hit, uh, that all stopped. And I realized that, man, these kids are just sitting around at home. They're so bored. They're not getting good 
opportunities. And so I, I created a camp I called it a youth drone camp. And that was launched in 2021 and, and that was going pretty well. And I, I also I remember the first time I mentioned this, this SEER idea that I had was coming back. Uh, I believe it was coming back. Maybe it was on the way to the MN or to the, um, conference in in las vegas there the commercial oh, UAB Expo. UAB Expo, yeah and i was i was on the plane with our coo and i mentioned this idea i want to use drones i want to get kids uh collecting data and we're going to do it uh relevant research data in winnipeg and i want to do it on dutch elm disease with my with my agricultural background uh specializing specializing in in conducting ag research using multi-spectral sensors and and that sort of thing and understanding how drones are used really at the research level in this and the scientific application of everything like why why don't we use it to look for diseases not in crops but in the trees because in winnipeg we have the largest elm tree canopy of any large city in north america with oh, wow. four hundred thousand elm trees and dutch elm disease uh, is very widespread across North America. It's here in Winnipeg and it's a huge problem. And yeah. uh, the city spends a lot of money every year trying to fight it. And the way that they fight it is by going around and looking for it visually, looking for symptoms. And I knew that plants often don't show symptoms of diseases. Um, bef they don't show it visually before they show it um, through the near infrared spectrum. The, oh, really? Yeah. And I imagine once they show it visually, it's almost, you know, it's kind of a little bit far down the road at that point. It is. Exactly. You know, or like it's hard. Like now, it's like now you're fighting this thing as opposed to trying to prevent it or nip it in the bud. It's so like it's, a human being. If you're sick, yeah, your temperature may be elevated a little bit before you even start to sweat and start it yeah. showing signs of being sick visibly. Yeah. And Plants do the same sort of thing with chlorophyll in their leaves. And so that's amazing. Uh, so that was the idea was to look at the trees from above where they're all that's that's where they get their energy from the, right the top of the tree getting all this light from the sun. So that's where plants put their chlorophyll concentrated the highest. Yeah. And if you're going to try and look for uh, symptoms like non visible symptoms of of uh, diseases the top would be better than below, which is what they normally do now. So you're, uh, you're pitching this idea to your COO on a plane at this point. And uh, Chad already, and he's like, well, if you want to do that, then go go for it. I don't understand. So how did, so did you leverage your connections, uh, your, your former connections uh, with education, with maybe your previous school uh, to, to then launch this thing? Or how did you... How did you connect with the right teachers, the right students to have the first SEER program? I I have uh, I had connections through the teacher training program I had developed first and started oh, right. in a few different school divisions in the in the city here. We call them school divisions in Manitoba, but they're school districts and other areas. Same thing, um, just groupings of of high schools and in the areas and uh and so anyways i reached out to one of our contacts it was seven oaks school division in north in the northern area of winnipeg and uh, they were interested in in a pilot project for the seer program and we ran it in 2022 okay in the spring of 2022 and it went very well and uh and so, so how many students like how many students you know did you use the inspire drone something different like Tell me a little bit about the, you know, kind of the five W's of how this program worked. Okay, sure. So the the Inspire drone is long retired. That okay. <laughs> the Inspire one, the Inspire two is retired. We're into this year or the last few years. We were using the uh, DJI Matrice 300 with a uh, with a Micasense Altum multispectral sensor on it. That's and then, a good drone. Yeah, it's a heavy duty system. The kids are just blown away by by it when they get the opportunity to see it. And some of them even get the opportunity to fly it because wow. we um, get them to write their their pilot exams ahead of time. Some of them 
do. Some of, some of them go ahead and 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 go for their advanced pilot certificate. And we say if you're if you're able to um, get the certification, then you get a chance to to fly some of the bigger equipment. Now, Maybe. these are high school kids, Matt. These high school, school kids, yeah, Fit fourteen years old and older. And how many in this first kind of pilot group did you have that you were working with? Yeah, at uh, at Seven Oaks School Division, there was fifteen students in year one, um, and then in year two, we grew. We added. We got a, actually. Uh, a grant from the government in year two for five hundred thousand dollars over wow. three years. Yeah, uh, the money goes to cover the registration costs of the school divisions taking part in the program. We're actually also partnered with the University of Winnipeg on this research project. So the idea behind the SEER program, I really, I, I haven't been doing it justice, given a good, ex, uh, good, a good explanation of what it is, but it's a research project. So we're engaging the students and actually capturing the data, teaching them how to capture the data for the real world application of we're doing research. We're trying to detect Dutch elm disease in elm trees, something that's never been done before using a drone, effectively anyways. And it, and we're in partnership. The University of Winnipeg has actually two years ago or two and a half years ago, they commissioned a research study. And um, over the last two years, we've been working with them providing data that we collect with the kids yeah. and other data collection as well with them. Um, but the kids in that way, they get a sense of being included in this research. And, and, and so that was the idea behind the funding that we received and that was spread over three years. So we, right now we're in year two of the funding cycle. Uh, we have 15 school divisions in Manitoba that are taking part in, in this program this year. Um, we ran it in Florida last year. We've run it across the the Western provinces and Saskatchewan and Alberta, and uh, we'll be heading out to British Columbia this year. So, um, yeah, it's pretty widespread. So in Florida, they have the elms that you're talking about. Is that part of the uh, collection or is that something different? So that was year one was the elm tree uh, study, and we expanded the program to include uh, the crop disease projects. So we have the Dutch Elm Disease Project, and then we had this other project called the the Crop Disease Project, and then I created another project called the Litter Project. So in the Crop Disease Project, we're using the same drone, same sensors, but taking kids out to an agricultural uh, area and doing working with a, a plot research partner and looking for actual crop diseases and growth okay. patterns and stuff like that in crops. Yeah. And then the Litter Project. Um, we're working to to use the same sensors and drone as again, but to identify different types of litter based on their reflectance values, whether they're plastic or metal or paper or glass. And uh, we're working with the University of Manitoba on a on a research study for that as well. Oh wow! So it's kind of the testing the sensors on the different materials. But is, what's the end game for for that one, the litter project? Is it also to identify areas where, you know, maybe there needs to be a cleanup or, yeah, some exactly. addition, you know? Yeah, so it uh, it will eventually be a, a digital tool. I mean, I haven't mentioned the machine learning component, but machine learning plays a critical role in all of this. I mean, we collect the data and then we use machine learning tools to analyze it automatically finding what an elm tree is based on like I mean you look at it at an image that we collect and it from above you look at of a park it just looks like a bunch of broccoli yeah and that, there's all these different types of trees mixed in there birch trees and elm trees and ash and oak and and poplar and but it's almost impossible for a human being to look at it and go oh that's an elm tree that's an elm tree but with enough examples that we're training the system uh with ground like ha knowing that it is an elm tree and saying that's an elm tree uh, you can train a machine learning algorithm to be able to automatically do that way better than any human could and and right now we, we've actually got an algorithm that's 92 percent accurate in detecting elm trees just from a from image imagery so it's um, incredible um, that is so also you talked about the chlorophyll and what's emanating you know from from the leaves uh, is that what sensor are you using? Is it a thermal sensor or something else? 
you, is multi-spectral? And if so, like what, what are the different, um, so the, the bands that we're capturing, uh, with the multi-spectral sensor are red, green, and blue, and then near infrared and red edge and near infrared more than red edge. Both of those two have a, uh, higher reflectance in, um, when it, in healthy plants versus, uh, unhealthy plants. They have a okay. very strong correlation there, but near infrared more than more than anything. Uh, so is your ML then, Matt, are you training your ML not only to detect the elm tree, but also then to detect the different ones? It. Yeah. Once it can find the elm trees, then it will scan the health of them and the reflectance value to try and determine, and that's what the research component was from University of Winnipeg was to to see if you can actually confirm based on reflectance values uh, from a drone, a multispectral sensor, if the tree is likely to have Dutch elm disease. It's not actually to confirm it 100%. You still need ground crews to go. Yeah. But what we can do now, instead of relying on the ground crews to look and, and diagnose and then do their ground inspection where they take a sample of the bark, um, to try and confirm if it's disease, we're basically trying to sh to say that hey, using this system, a drone with this sensor, you can actually be more accurate, uh, at least as accurate, if not more accurate, um, than than the traditional ground based uh, method, and you don't use nearly as much carbon while you're driving. I mean, the crews are driving around all day, looking at trees where a drone is just in a very short period of time covering the same area or more um, without need, needing to drive at all. That's amazing. So uh, I'm going to go off script, uh, Matt, so bear with me. I, do you have any, so there, there are a lot of folks out there like you that are very inspired to, to teach the next generation, to teach them about drones. I think what you're doing is very unique with this experiential aspect. Um, but do you have any, you, you were successful in, in obtaining a three year $500,000 grant. That's significant. Do you have any tips for people out there listening on how they too uh, can create similar programs uh, to help schools in their neighborhood or colleges or high schools? Yeah, there, there are lots of grants out there. There's tons of grants. Um, there's national grants and then there's little, there's community foundation grants that there's hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of those in different communities around. Uh, so first of all, just trying to find funding bodies in the case of the Research Manitoba grant, um, I just had reached out to them. It, it wasn't a specific grant that they had put out. I reached out and said, hey, is this something that might be fundable? And are you able to help me figure out how to find funding for this? And and through that process, we were actually the first aerospace project to be funded by Research Manitoba. And it's just by reaching out and trying to make those connections and, and letting them know that, uh, I mean, the magnitude of, of what we're working on is pretty, pretty interesting. We're engaging kids, potentially in Winnipeg anyways, in detecting um, Dutch elm disease, which ultimately could lead to early diagnosis, early treatment, early removal of trees, and eventually decreasing the spread and potentially over time eradicating this, the disease. And if you can get ahead of it, then you can get rid of it. I don't know and, a lot about Dutch elm disease. I imagine it wipes out entire like ecosystems if it goes unchecked. Oh yeah, yeah, there's the cities. So it, it, the epicenter of Dutch elm disease in North America is in Ohio. Um, and it was brought in through some firewood that was brought from Europe and um, it spread across all across the, the country, can, uh, Canada and the United States. Um, and in areas like Toronto, they've lost 90% of their elm tree population from when it was initially introduced in Montreal. They've had, they've completely been decimated and wow. most of the areas like Cleveland used to have a lot of elm trees and some other bigger cities in in ohio they were the first ones and it just spread very quickly from there no no doubt so 
uh, you're in Canada. You've been very successful in doing this in Canada. You mentioned you've been down to Florida. Tell us a little bit about some of the programs you have in the U.S. Yeah, so we ran the litter project in in Florida last year. Uh, that one went very well. Uh, we had it was mostly grade nines actually that were taking part in that. And it was now was that with a a school or college both? It was with Hernando County School District. Oh, cool! All right, just uh, about an hour north of Tampa. So yeah, yeah that was a really neat experience. Um, and uh, we've actually been working with uh, several universities uh, over the last, well, last year and this year across the United States, looking to apply for for some large grants uh, as well. I think universities are quite interested in this program uh, because it can be run. It doesn't have to be a high school program. It can be run at a post-secondary level. Like it's really high level advanced stuff. Yes. We can modify it for younger people or for older people, and it can be run for adult learners as well uh, as a kind of a, this is especially in agriculture as a way to say, this is how you can use drones effectively to monitor your fields and uh, use them for, for crop uh, disease detection and, yeah. and health analysis and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's several universities that we were talking to uh, in last fall and winter, mm -hmm. um, and things are developing across in, in uh, uh, Virginia and Tennessee and Texas. There's quite a bit of interest, specifically in those areas, and uh, Ohio is a is a hot state for for drone stuff going on right now. In Colorado. Yeah, color. I mean, I'm in Colorado. And I don't know if you knew that, but I'm in Colorado Springs and. Uh, the University of Colorado Boulder has an amazing program. In fact, I'm at, I'm speaking uh, to a class there on Thursday uh, about drone law and policy, but uh, they've been doing really interesting, like storm chasing weather uh, research there for years. Uh, in fact, Jack, Dr. Jack Elston um, graduated from there, he, he started in that program, created Black Swift Technologies and uh, the S2 drone like goes in these crazy environments like volcanoes and hurricanes. They launch it off of P, P3 airplanes and all these things, but, um, or P2s, P3s, I think it is a P3. So just like my company. Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, the sky's the limit when it comes to education and what you can do with drones. Um, you know, what, what you're doing is really, really special. I hope people that are watching will reach out to you, Matt, to, to learn a little bit more how they can get involved, uh, learn from your experience, uh, not only in the classroom and from the military, but you've created this program from scratch and, and it's obviously highly successful. So um, can you share with us any like success stories, whether it's a particular student that was in your program that turned around to do this, this big thing or uh, a really interesting um, development that that you all learned somewhere along the way during the course of, of one of these research projects uh, that was a first that nobody knew about before. I think it's really cool when when uh, the students are inspired through the programs that we run, whether it's a SEER program or the Youth Drone Camp, uh, but to, to go on and try to get the next level of certification. So in Canada, we have basic or an advanced, which is similar in some ways to the uh, trust certification and the part 107 in the United States. Mm. Kind of get them started with that trust. And and if they're, uh, or the trust exam, I should say, and if they're enthused by their success there, then why don't you try the part 107? Let's go work towards that. We've got a uh, a part 107 program that um, I developed in 2019 uh, and have been updating over the years that we actually have a partnership with drone blocks and and our our um, our curriculum for the part 107 is offered on drone blocks website as like for free um, and um, through that uh, if, if students go on and get that that's really cool that's that's really them buying into the opportunity. And that's actually the coolest thing about being a teacher is when you can get a student to 
get enthusiastic about something and and push themselves to do something that's difficult. Part 107, uh, the Advanced Pilot Certificate in Canada, those are not easy things to do if you don't have a background in, in aviation uh, to, to be able to go into that fairly out of the blue and excel and get your certification. That's really, that's, that's awesome. That happened not a lot so far uh, in terms of seeing the kids in these programs take that initiative and go on. All I can do is push them and, and hope that they, they do that. Well, we've had about, I think, 15 so far that have gone on beyond their basic certificate to, to go on to the next level. Yeah, but you know what? Even so, um, yeah. Look, it's it's not being a drone pilot is enough for everybody. Um, and even if they got their certificate, maybe they wouldn't use it. But what you're doing is, for example, teaching trigonometry, teaching artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, analytics, right? So it's much deeper than just hey, you know, I got my, you know, I taught a kid how to fly a drone. It's it's much, much deeper than that. And I think uh, that that is the significance of your program. So you've been able to get the grant money. You're working with a lot of educational institutions in the U.S. and Canada, Matt. Um, are there any companies, you know, kind of additional to Volatis or outside of Volatis uh, that are that you're working with as well, kind of in a teaming manner uh, on on this program or something similar? Um, so. Right now, I mentioned drone blocks. Where there are yeah, yeah. That, that they have really awesome uh, curriculum out there for kids to learn how to code. And so we use uh, drone blocks as app in our youth drone camp program, uh, where we teach about coding with drones and they have to fly through a, a course and do some cool stuff. Um, but other than them, like uh, we don't have a lot of of direct partners in in uh, in the Caribbean, we have Drift Drift Enterprises and and uh, um, specifically to 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 offer our education programs, and cool. then and then our other kind of partners that we work with. ICMS is one of our partners uh, who are a growing partner in Canada, and they they're for our um, plot research component of the crop disease project. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we talked about how, you know, teachers can learn from you about how to get grant money and how to kind of do these things. Right. Um, let's take it from the student's perspective. Say I'm a student and I love what you're saying, Matt, and I want to somehow get involved in a research project with you or like what you're doing. Where do I start? How do I do that? <clears throat> so we have a Volatis has their um, website that has lots and lots of stuff going on there because uh, Volatis is involved in a lot of different aspects of the drone industry. Um, we've put together a separate website uh, called dronesined.com, which is a part of Volatis, uh, but it's like our education wing. Yeah. And uh, that that website outlines our different programs and the SEER program and where you can have contact us if you have questions about it. Uh, basically, it starts with the interest. I, I can't reach out to all the high schools and all the universities out there. It often starts with them coming to us and um, saying this is something that we're interested in. I can help or we can help write grants. It's a lot of the, I've got quite a background now in writing grants and uh, it's not just that single grant. We've received another $50,000 grant out in British Columbia and in the States. Um, it's, it's something that I think is a big part of education. That's it how is. they can take part in these programs. The schools don't just have wads of money that they're sitting on. If they want to take, take part in, in cool projects like this and high tech stuff, often they'll need to apply for funding in some way. So why not help and get involved in that process? Oh, that that's excellent. Yeah, I think the grant writing thing is a mystery to a lot of people. I mean, heck, I'm a trained lawyer and I, I don't know how to do it. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that I think you have to have that background and experience uh, to do it. So uh, as you look ahead, because we only have a couple of minutes left, Matt, I knew our time would fly, uh, pun intended. Uh, as you look forward, into this year, maybe into 2025 as well. 
what, what's on what's on deck for uh, for this year program? Uh, we've added we've added other projects. So in the Caribbean, I mentioned our partner in, in the Caribbean. We have the mangrove project where we're using it's the same it's the same idea the same idea as the Dutch Elmsies project, but we're looking at mangroves and the health of mangrove forests rather than elm trees and Very we have cool. another project called the invasive species project where we're looking for different types of um, plant or pr more so plant than animal uh, invasive species that might be visible in like state parks and and uh, beetle kill i mean when i drew when we went to yosemite uh was it yosemite? no yellowstone national park in wyoming uh it was so depressing as we were driving through and all the tree it looked like the lorax in a way had come through you know all the trees were or no it looked like the nightmare before christmas right yeah. like none of the leaves had trees and they were all just withered and black with like you know it looked spooky like something from halloween and it's just decimating entire forests yeah uh, so to be able to use a drone to to catch these things early and be able to you know treat the treat the actual problem instead of you know well again usually it's too late by the time you see it uh and there's not a lot people can do right so that that tree is a goner uh unless you can catch catch these things early so um super cool all right what other uh do you have anything else brewing so you've got um the caribbean you've got um uh mangroves and uh other in infestation uh research that you're doing um anything else you want to talk about in like i think like the one or two minutes we have left yeah in uh 2024 2025 we're launching our uh drone light show program which is an educational program yeah that's going to be really cool it's indoor um light show uh programming and um in terms of other like projects within the SEER program specifically, whether it's something I've mentioned or not, like we can customize programming too. That's the neat thing about working with universities is we can see what kind of sustainable, like ecologically sustainability problems might be present in their area and how can we use our equipment and our expertise to help them with the research to to go after that or detect yeah. it and then tie in the schools around them it's usually not like a super it's like i'm piecing together a puzzle that has many many different pieces yeah um but when it all comes together it looks really nice that's cool well i love 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 what you're doing uh thank you so much because uh you're just making a huge difference not only for these kids and their teachers but for society writ large, so Matt, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for taking this time with us. It was so uh, inspirational for me personally to hear your story, uh, to hear how you created SEER and how far it's come and, and where it's going. Uh, so as we sign off, Matt, could you please tell folks how they can reach you uh, and any other closing comments you want to make before we sign off today? Yeah, my, uh, my contact information I think you'll have I think we saw it on one of the slides, matthew.johnson at veladaserialspace.com. It's a long email, takes up a lot of space, so you don't have to commit it to memory. It's probably best just to find it in one of the one of the screens on here. And um, yeah, send me an email if you're interested and we can go from there. All right, well, awesome. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you, everybody out there. We are out here. <laughs>